Hello, my name is Walter Tinsley, and I'm excited to introduce you to this set of upcoming lectures, which I call Through the Looking Glass, books that can enhance your perspective and reveal the important things which are invisible to most people. I've come to understand as a private tutor that I have a unique perspective on things, and I had some student demand on how I've come to have this perspective. I would really just enjoy sharing that with you, and I hope to do so in the following lectures. My goal with this set is to give you a window into what's actually going on that most people do not or will not ever have. And I'd like to start by giving you a few examples. The first one is, years ago, I was casting around and looking for an, exact, an example of something we could all agree happened. This was part of a larger study into what is objective, what we can all agree on are facts or on interpretations or something that cannot be interpreted. Best thing I thought I the best thing I really came up with was that the sun rose this morning. We have ample evidence that the sun rose this morning. Now people will argue are we really in the dream? Are we in the matrix? Are we awake when we're awake? And we can go down those rabbit holes, but they're essentially un unanswerable. But I thought be it in a dream or be it in waking or real life, we could agree that the sun rose this morning. Uh, obviously in the real world, if the sun did not rise, you know, all sorts of other problems would be <laughs> happening, regardless of your worldview, even if you think that the world is flat or that uh, Apollo is carrying uh, across the sun across the sky in a chariot and all sorts of things. Uh, in a dreamscape, that gets a little bit more problematic, but we can adjust for that in other ways. So we can all agree that the sun rose this morning. Well, here's the trouble with that. Let's take this apart a little bit. Can we agree this? If someone says, oh, look, the sun is rising, that's not actually what's going on, right? We say these things, and everyone understands what every person means. And people have said this, and maybe even animals say this to each other. That, oh, look, notice the sunrise. But the sun has actually is not rising. The earth is spinning on its axis, and the appearance of the sunrise is a byproduct of that. And that's something I would say you'd have a lot of trouble explaining to that animal. The other component is, if, if we're going to keep on going down that train of thought, is that the sun has actually never risen. Because the sun is the sort of stable component or locus or focus point in our solar system, and it doesn't, it doesn't rise, right? We tilt around this particular axis. So that's just a little bit into view. So obviously, if you just want to go about your day-to-day -day life, you can say the sun is rising. Well and good. No one will ever give you problems for said statement, or at least most people. Um, I might, but like, you know, not most of the time. The other component part of this is, is though, is that if you can see that in fact the sun is not rising, you have a tremendous advantage over people who do believe that the sun is rising, right? If you and a collective collaborative group got around and used your new insights, you could do things like send rockets around, shoot people, land people on the moon, land people on Mars. You could do big things with that larger understanding. These are the sorts of perspective changes which I'm hoping to guide you through. Claim to have found all of them, and in fact, part of what I'm going to try and do with this lecture series is give you tools so that you can find your own. I mean, you might want to keep those secretive, or if you want to share those with the community, I uh, encourage you to do so. You can contact me. I'm sure we'll have some sort of way to contact other members uh, in this lecture series. So, all right, let's get into the next example. Uh, the next example is what I'm going to call, very quickly, the illusion of choice. And the quick example here would be with fast food restaurants. Everything in that fast food restaurant, if you decide, hey, let's go get fast food food. Fast food food, is that a word? I don't even know. But let's, let's say you want to go out and get some of this fast food. I don't want to name any particular chain because they're all guilty of it. And uh, in fact, even a lot of businesses which are not in fast food do these things. Everything about that dining experience has been designed to get you in, process you to make the sale, and get you out very quickly. And a component part of that menu has deliberately and cynically been designed to get you your grease and sugar in the cheapest way possible and then get you back, get you craving that grease and sugar and to uh, acclimate you to certain triggers. Everything from, like, the temperature in the restaurant and the way the seats have been designed, so on and so forth, have been tested and retested and worked out to a formula to get you 
in and out of that restaurant as soon as possible. Have you ever seen people lounging around in a Taco Bell or a fast food place like McDonald's or Burger King? Don't they seem like aberrant or unusual? Notice the environment you're in. Notice how it's hard to carry a conversation with the decibel level of the music. Notice how you know, the temperature feels, how the chairs feel, how the people are processed. And, and watch crowds come in and come out, right? See who's doing this. They have designed an entire system to bring you in or get you through the drive through and get you out in a certain way. And you can see these people being processed. All right. Let me see if I can bring this home with my third example. Uh, and, and by the way, test all these out for yourself. See what you think, right? This is not about me giving to you the wisdom from the mountain on high. I'm trying to show you the jewels, the treasures I've come across in this world, and I want to share them with you so that you can find your own treasures. Tool use is an iterative process. We do not take a stone, use it as a hammer, and then build a space probe. We use that stone, combine it with a, a lever to make a hammer, and we use that hammer to make better tools, to make better tools, to make better tools. And we're going through a, an explosion of this right now. We're in a golden age of technology right now, and no one can know how this is all going to end up. So, for the time being, let's talk about Pokemon. Uh, before the singularity happens. This third example is what I like to call the Pokemon phenomenon. Right now, in Japan, there is a dedicated team of experts working to persuade North American children to persuade their parents to spend money on them on Pokemon. And let's not forget the Chinese markets as well. And they have figured out, and they continue to incrementally improve, ways to get your children to play Pokemon. They have figured all sorts of triggers out. Your child does not actually have to even see Pokemon uh, on the television. You know, they, they can only be exposed to it through a group. And once they're exposed, they have a certain situation for enticing that child in. Gotta catch them all, gotta catch them all. And then they have uh, further situations. They figured out how what words, and they will tell you, you know, the child in the words, the words to use to get their parents to buy them said Pokemon, right? All of these things have been, in, you know, figured out well in advance and projected in the campaign to get your child, or if, you know, you are ever a child and you're passionate you like Pokemon, to get you to do these things at a particular age window. And importantly, they also have a way of transitioning you out into other things, like Naruto, right? They're, they're you know, some most people say, oh, well, it's just a phase, they go through Pokemon. Well, yes, and then they have the next phase waiting for you which is Naruto. Naruto! Uh, so, obviously... <laughs> uh, because, obviously, cynical manipulation processes are never, never used by the political forces in this country uh, to cynically manipulate you into making certain purchases and voting particular directions, or active, or even just not being active in your own political situation, uh, locally or nationally. Politicians in this country never do this. It's always, always done by only foreigners. They are the only manipulative people, foreigners. Or uh, let me put this another way. Should you ever be interested in finding out what sort of other influences may or may not be influencing the lives of you and your family, build this sort of lecture series to explore that. I hope to explore your relationship with the myths and common stories that people have uh, and give you an insight into things that they cannot see behind them. I hope to explore your relationship with technology. We live in a golden age of technology right now. Uh, but importantly, technology is such an interesting uh, component. We have unique insights and a re unique relationship with technology as a species that really, I think, is, is largely unexplored. It's obvious to us in the sense that we might ask, why do all Americans or most Americans speak English, or why is this the you know uh, common language of, of the U.S.? Without actually, I mean, it's just such an obvious question. But if you start looking in behind that and seeing why these things are, you get to a, a, a fantastically powerful understanding of our relationship uh, to to technology, and, and well, and also English. Should you want to go through that, down that direction, but I'm I can I can tell you the technology component and our uh, how we as a species look at that. Uh, I'd like to do what I can to illuminate what political structures or political influences are shaping our choices here and there that are largely invisible. Uh, you know, I should even try and change the title of this series to The Important Invisible Things Which Shape Your Life or something along those lines. All right. 
Uh, I'd hope to talk to you about your relationship with nature. This is another thing which is very artificial and constructed, and uh, or at least it's it's the the paradigm most people have is is built out of expediency and uh, uh, contrivance. There are much better ways of viewing our relationship with nature that I think most people would appreciate. Uh, interpersonal, uh, the way we chat with. Uh, other people is surprisingly interesting and comes obviously from a mammalian background. Uh, the way we interact with each other is has a particular legacy which is different from others and uh, is fruitful to explore. The way we interact with ourselves, the way our mind uh, reacts with its own thoughts is fascinating and I hope to, as I say, give you a larger insight into what's going on there. Hope to talk to you about your own thoughts in regards to productivity and how we how we get things done and some illusions on our relationship to our work. I hope to uh, also chat with you about uh, the relationship with people ha that people have with money and politics. Maybe that'll be the same. Maybe it'll be different. Uh, I have some ideas on how to break up either of those. But uh, to anybody who, who wants to kind of understand what's you know actually going on behind the scenes of when they make certain decisions uh, at the store, or in day-to-day -day life, I, as I say, hope to give you an insight into the both monetary and to finally also the political situation of what's going on. You are welcome to agree or disagree. You might have a finer tool uh, or toolkit for understanding these things. Please feel free to contact me and uh, correct me where I'm wrong. And uh, anyhow, that's what I hope to do with this lecture series, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for your time.